Okay, let's go. Today we're going to discuss the galuts, the exiles, the Jewish people. Wapen galut, the four galuts, the end of the fourth galut, a possible fifth galut, and then back to Mashiach again. Okay, so let's start with the idea of a galut exile in general, and why we have it. Exile galut. So we know, according to the prophets, that the Jewish people would be exiled. Actually, it goes back to Yaakov Avinu, actually. Will be exiled four times. Four times throughout Jewish history. Four big exiles. There's been lots of small exiles. Kicked out of Poland here and there and other exiles. But all these small exiles are actually tucked into the four big ones. Okay? Let's go through, first of all, three reasons for exile. Three reasons. And then let's go through the four exiles. And let's find a fifth one as well. So the three reasons for Galut, for the exile of the Jewish people. What does exile do for us as a nation? Let's go through those together, if we may. Why would God put us into exile in the first place? We are doing so well. We're in Eretz Yisrael. The sun is shining. We ought to do all the mitzvot that exist in the land of Israel, not just a few of them by being in Chutz Laaretz, and everything's going swimmingly. We have a temple. We're worshipping Hashem. And then come the Babylonians, come the Greeks, come the Romans, come the Medians, the Persians. Not, not the Persians from Great Name, by the way. Those ones are okay. I'm saying, no, I have nothing against them whatsoever. I'm just not, all right. It's not some queen. Remember. Why exactly do we have to go through exile? What is the purpose for exile? That's not rhetorical. I'll take an answer to the question. Okay, yes. Um, a wake-up call, wake call. Why do we need a wake-up call? Like, there were times that the Israel weren't acting respectfully towards each other. Okay. Very, very good. So the answer is because of sin. As we say in Tefillah, Because of our sins, we were kicked out of our land. Because of sin. The land of Israel, we mentioned, if you remember correctly, is sensitive to hate, to sin. We mentioned that Rashi, that just like a sensitive stomach, cannot tolerate certain types of foods. The land of Israel is like a sensitive stomach. It's okay at Yoshvi. It vomits out its inhabitants, no matter who they are, who mispave in the land. The land itself is alive and therefore cannot tolerate sin. Therefore, you sin. You get kicked out. This, of course, is also mentioned in the Shema. That's one major answer to this question. And therefore, exile itself is a form of kapara. When the Jewish people are removed and have to live in foreign lands, under foreign governments, under foreign soil, which in many cases, most of history has been very difficult, the suffering that goes through with exile, because the suffering that goes with it, right? Although we don't really feel it today, in many countries, but in many countries we do, the gullet itself, the, the, the feeling, the, pa the pain that comes with it, of being separated from our home territory, our home soil itself, is painful. By the way, a side point I mention again, there's always been a Jewish presence in the land of Israel. When we talk about exile, we talk physically, most of the Jewish people were kicked out, or, as we'll see with the third exile, we weren't even kicked out. We were in Israel, and yet we were in exile. So exile isn't just a geographical movement of the people. It's also a state of being. Galut is a state of being. Okay? Okay. So first of all, the sin, the suffering that goes with it, and therefore you have to return. That's one answer given. Another answer, another answer, is given in the Gemara. And the Gemara says that David and Melech cannot come until the goof is empty. Until the goof is empty. What in heaven's name is the goof? So the goof literally means the body. But the Gemara says there is a storehouse of neshamot, of souls, that need to come into this world before Mashiach can come. Every nesham has to come, whether you believe once or twice, but on a basic level, according to the Gemara, at least one time to come in, and that storehouse of souls has to come into this world 
And that's going to be the final thing. Therefore, we're always going to be in a state of exile. By the way, these ants are not mutually exclusive. Right? They can be connected, and there can be one answer eventually, as we'll see. And therefore, we have to wait for all the souls that are being held in the guf, the storehouse and the shamot in Shemayim, and they have to come into this world until that last soul comes, come into this world to fill its tikkun, its mission in this world. Mashiach cannot come. That is the second answer to the question of why we remain in Galut until Mashiach comes and fixes us. The final answer, which is probably the most stunning and extraordinary answer, but is mentioned by great scholars, the Maharsha and others among them. Svas Emes makes a big deal of this. And that is, anybody? Why do we have to be all over in Russia and France and Persia and America and England and Kabul and Libya and Morocco and all the other countries that have taken the Jewish people? I will start with that. You did, yeah. Or Legoyim. What does Or Legoyim mean? A light into the nations. Yes. Hannah, are you going to say the same thing? Right. We're meant to be an Or Legoyim, a light into the nations. Now, the best way to do it is by being in Israel. Yeah? However, seemingly, that's not sufficient. It can't just be because of sin, because I shouldn't going to punish us another way. So exile's got to involve more than just the forgiving or the um, uh, acting out of sin being repented for. Okay? Or like Goyim means we have to be a light to the nations. And for some reason, that is best done. That is be that's the words of the prophet, the Nabi Yashah talks about Ola Goyim. That is best done not on our home soil. They actually go a little bit further. The rabbis say that in each generation, actually let's go back. We know that Avram Avin, listen to this amazing idea. Let's just follow the sequence over here, it'll make a lot of sense. Avram Avin, we know, had a number of souls that he and his wife, Nefesh Asu, right, they have a number of souls that they were Makarev. These people did not become the Jewish people. Only Avram Avinu's descendants became. What happened to them? They went away to their home territories, where they lived, right? They lived in uh, Midian, right? Wherever they lived, right? They went home, but they didn't become Jewish. Many years later, okay, Sarah Mary had a child, and she also, we're told, was able to breastfeed a number of children as well. That was her proof, actually, that... Uh, that she was the uh, biological mother and she was pregnant at the age of 90 and she breastfed a number of children as well. Okay, Many years later, let's jump forward, the Jewish people are Hasinai. We know that every nation was offered the Torah and they said, Marketiv, be what's in it? And said, we can't steal. And Yishmael said, we can't, we're not interested, we're stealers, right? And said, you can't commit adultery, right? And the other nation says, well, you know, adultery is part of who we are, okay? that we don't want it. And every nation was asked and rejected. Eventually, the Jewish people said, Nasa Benishma, two, two of the most famous words in the entire Torah. We'll do it, and then we'll listen to what's in it. Okay? The commentators say an amazing thing. There were actually individuals in those other nations that wanted, that wanted to say yes. However, they were outvoted. Think of it as a democracy. So they said, we don't want the Torah. But there were individuals who said, I want it. What happened to those individuals? Later on in Jewish history, they would, if you believe this, they would be allowed to reincarnate and come back as future converts to the Jewish people. Why would those few individuals turn around and say, yeah, we want it? Why would they be different? Because they were the original souls that Avram Avinu had converted and brought together, and that Sarah Menu had weaned as well. And therefore, those are the original souls. So right through history, you're going to see converts who actually really were probably part of that original cohort who will be spread out throughout history. So what's that, what's that got to do with us? So we have to attract those converts. And if we're in Eretz Yisrael, if we're in the land of Israel, it's difficult to get them. And therefore, the Jewish people were spread out and exiled, an amazing answer, throughout the world, right, which may help with sins and may help empty out the guf, but it's also going to help for those individuals and those nations to see us, right, that person in China, that person in France, that person in Russia, wherever they are, and be like, oh yeah, I want to go to my local, you know, Chabad house, whatever it is, you know, 
right? And I want to get involved in that. I want to go. And those converts actually are the original souls, very holy souls, that actually said yes at Har Sinai, but were outvoted because their nation said no. Okay? If you want to go with the reincarnation concept and understanding. If you don't, converts need to be attracted, and therefore we were put into exile to Galut in order to bring them out. Okay? So those are three possible reasons. I'm sure there's more, but the three main reasons and the benefits that come with exile with Galut. Now, of course, when the Shia comes, it's all over. Okay. Now let's jump to... We're going to have to move fast today. Let's jump to Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu is running away from his twin evil brother, Esau. Esau was made of Yitzhak. He rejected that path. And Yaakov takes the birthright from him, which he sells for literally a bowl of beans. And he's on the run, right? Because his mother Rivka says, go and go stay with my brother Lavan, and you'll be safe over there. Which he was, but it was an unfortunate experience. So we see here that Yaakov is leaving Eretz Yisrael to go into Galut, into exile. Okay? So that becomes the prototype. Yaakov becomes the prototype for the idea of exile. He represents the Jew in Galut. Yaakov represents the Jew in exile, the exiled Jew. And all the challenges come with it. So when you see Yaakov go through, the Jewish people go through mass of similar banim, he's gonna have business troubles, he's gonna make money, he's gonna lose lots of money, he's gonna be try to be killed, he's gonna be tricked. Everything Yaakov goes through, he represents Mr. Galut. Now on his way out of Eretz Yisrael, he gets to the mountain of Moriah, Har HaMariah. On that mountain, he goes to sleep for the first time. By the way, before he went to Galut, he learned a lot of Torah. 14 years of Torah in order to prepare himself for Galut. Okay, now we're in Galut. Very much Torah we have to learn. And that was Yaakov. So now Yaakov is in Har HaMariah. He's on a mountain. Mm -hmm. There was no Torah. Yeah, right. right. So the Torah, there was Torah, there was information they used to learn. There was actually a Shiva of Shem and Ever. And what did they learn? That's a big discussion. Some say the laws of Avod Zarah was the form of Torah they learned. Okay? It wasn't the five books of Moses we have. And some say they actually had a Tarag mitzvah, able to learn. But they learned a lot about Hilchot Avod Zarah, what not to do, which had been passed down from Adam Rishon, right? And all the way down to Avram, Yitzchak, and Noah. So information was known. It wasn't the Torah as we have it today. So I have a question uh, about number two, when you said about the book. Yeah. We believe that the Ol Neshama exists already, or... That Ol Neshama, that's the, that's the, the context. But we believe that God creates new Neshama all the time. No. They're all from creation was set up, and then through history they're brought into this world. That's what the Gemara seems to intimate by saying that. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. You don't have to believe in reincarnation for that. That's just... There are neshamot, and uh, they come out at a certain point. So do you know how many? I don't know. No, like people, like, do people just take light about that? If you don't believe in reincarnation... They believe they say there are... It's difficult to say, because they say there are 600,000 primordial neshamot of the Jewish people, but one neshamot can be split into two, three, four, or five. It doesn't have to be one thing. One body can't be two places at the same time, but one neshamot can. Wait, we believe that neshamot are only Jews? Or are they... No, no, everyone has neshamot. Right, you sure. going. I'm talking about Jewish. We're talking about the Jewish souls have to come out in order to bring that. Oh, this you're talking about just about Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Okay. Yeah. okay, so Yaakov gets to Amaria. On Amaria, he sees a ladder. He has a dream. In the dream, there is a ladder. On the ladder, there are four angels going up the ladder. There are four angels going up the ladder. Okay? He sees the angels of the four exiles the Jewish people go through. So there are four Mlachim, there are four, four angels, and they represent the four exiles. Babel, I'm in English, I'm sorry. Madai and Paras, Yavan, and Edom. Okay? So Yaakov sees four angels, and each one of these angels are representing these four nations that are going to exile his descendants. So he goes to exile, and he's feeling it. And the angels are going up, and they're going down. They are Oilim, the Yordim. Going up, and they're going down this ladder. Okay? 
Rashi asks very famously why they're going up and down on angels in the heavens. Should they be going down and up? And he says, no, the angels were actually also protecting Yaakov. And there's Hebrew angels, Israeli angels, and there are outside Israel angels. And there was a change of God. That's not for now. But they were going up and they were going down on this ladder. Now, the ladder had runs. And he saw the first angel climbed and came down 70 runs. The second angel went up and went down 52 runs. The third angel went up and down 130 runs on this ladder. And the last angel went up and up and up and up and up and never seemed to come down. When he saw this fourth angel going up and up, this angel of Edom going up and up and up and up, going down, he excuse the expression, freaked out and became very, very scared. What do these rungs represent? The amount of years that each exile would last for. We have the 70 year of the Babylonian exile. We have the 52 years of the Madai to Paras. We have 130 of Yavan of Greece and Edom. So this is the Babylonian exile of Nebuchadnezzar. This is the Median, which then melted into the Persian exile. Okay, that's Paras. We have the Greek exile. Okay, that's the whole Hanukkah story. So here's Purim falls over here. Okay, the Greek one is, of course, the Hanukkah story. And then we have the last one, which is Edom, which according to most commentators, right, this is the, I don't know how to translate Edom, but it's the, The Roman one, I guess, is the best one, or the Romans aren't there, but we are living the continuation of the Roman exile. That's usually how it's translated, yeah. Okay, but it's not really sufficient because it represents. So these are the four. Actually, I believe they say that these actually have the same gematria. Oil of the Yoridim has the same gematria as all these names put together. If you finagle a little bit, and it comes to 428. That seems to be the key number somehow of Oil of the Yoridim and 428, which is. Not these numbers, right? But the gematria, the numerical value of Babal, Prasamada, Yavan, and uh, Edom. Okay? Many years later, many years later, oh, so Yaakov had to be reassured that this final exile, which he didn't see the return of, the angels never came down from this one, just going up and up and up and up and up, and he's freaking out. He saw them go up, oil him. He saw them go up. He see, okay, they're going to go up in power, they're going to rule over us, but there's going to be a a hump, they're going to come down. And he saw it with one, two, and three, but not four. Interesting as a side point, this Greek exile, the Jewish people are in Eretz Yisrael. That's where the Greek exile happened. That's where the Greek exile happened. And therefore we see that Galut does not exclusively mean being kicked out of Eretz Yisrael. It may include that, but it means that Hashem's Shechina, God's presence, was exiled from the Jewish people. Okay, so that is a proof to the fact that we can still be in Eretz Yisrael, have control of the land of Israel, right? But still be in a state of galut, of exile, because Hashem is not revealing himself in full capacity. So, uh, so Yaakov was eventually reassured and told, Hashem reassured him and said, don't worry, your descendants from this final angel, right, will return. Okay, that reassurance was good enough for him. He was able to continue his journey outside of Eretz Yisrael and go live for all those years and get married, right, to Rachel Leah and, uh, and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, did, they, like, did they only figure out what the Gauls were, like the countries after it happened? It was revealed to Yaakov. Actually, a lot more. Yaakov also knew when the end would be. Yaakov also knew when Mashiach would come, but he was not permitted to reveal that information. Right? It was Sosom. It was closed off, which is why the parasha and you know, he is closed off as well. He wasn't allowed to reveal the, the, uh, the time of the end as well. Now, many years later, Daniel the prophet, who was somebody else who knew the Cates, he knew the Cates, he knew the end, he had a vision. Okay? He was a very great prophet. And Daniel, him of the, uh, in the lion's den and survived, so with him was someone very special, obviously. He saw these four as different beasts of different creatures. And what he did was, excuse me, he like, Hashem like double clicked on each one of these four and gave Daniel 
a bit of an insight into them. One had already happened by the time Daniel turned, Daniel turned up, and the rest will reveal to him a little bit later. Okay? So let's just go into those four beasts, as they are referred to uh, in Chazal. The first one, the first beast was Babel. Okay, so these are the, this is Daniel's prophecy. You'll see it's the same for Daniel. Okay? And there, he goes into great detail of these four animals, what they look like. What are these four creatures that Daniel sees as they relate to these four exiles. So the first one of Babel was a leopard. Um, I'm sorry, a lion. My mistake. Was a lion, okay, with eagle's wings. Now, these are all going to be metaphors, okay? A lion is a very majestic royal animal, and that is a reference to Nebuchadnezzar, right, the king of the Babylonians, okay, who was very, very regal. He came from a royal line, right? Unlike Ahasuerus, we'll get to him in a few minutes. Unlike him, who did not come from a royal line, Nebuchadnezzar did. He was true royalty. He was uh, an evil individual who destroyed the first temple, which is the first exile of Babel, okay? So the first temple was destroyed by him, and the Jewish people were exiled, okay? For 70 years. That's the 70 years between the destruction of the first temple and the rebuilding of the second temple. The 70 years, okay? That 70 years was known, Jeremiah the prophet also referred to and told us would be in exile for 70 years. Where the 70 years began and ended, we weren't sure about, actually. Jews and non Jews had their own versions. Achish version of his calculation, which was wrong, right? Which is why the third year of Achish Verish's reign, he makes a big party. Kishevis Achish Verish al Kisse when he was sitting on his throne. Why did he in the third year? He calculated that the end of the exile of the Jewish people was a, ended up being in the third year of his reign. One second. The third year of his reign. Okay. He was wrong. He was off by many, many, 17, 18, whatever it is, 20 years, whatever he was off by. Okay, that was his miscalculation because he mistook the beginning of the 70 years and therefore the beginning's off, the end's off as well. So he had his calculation, Esther had her calculation, everyone had their own calculation, only a Karish Baruch knew the end. But it was 70 years, and it was a given. Okay, that's why he threw a big party. Why is, Ahasuerus, why is the beginning of the Megillah with Ahasuerus throwing a big party? He's like, end of the 70 years, your prophet was wrong, we're still here. He threw a big party. That's why the party was in the third year of his reign. Okay. Next we have Madai and uh, Paras, the next animal. Okay. Oh, by the way, what Daniel saw that the wings... The wings represent movement. An eagle represents swift movement through the skies. The wings were plucked. So he was sure, he saw that they were going to end and they were plucked, which he was actually living in that time, Daniel. The next was, um, the next of them was um, Madai and Paras, okay, which was the bear. That was the bear. That's how he saw the animal that represented the animal. Much later, yes, because it went from one right through to the end over there. That's where he ended up. He was the end of the 70 years. Okay? So now we have the bear over here. And the bear represents the Persians. Because they're big hairy. and they're hairy. That's what Hazal's saying. Which person I'm offended by, but it's just the way it is. What can I say? Okay? Bear is a strong animal. A little bit. Um, by the way, the Persians today have no ancestral connection to the Persians back then. There's actually no connection. Everyone's been moved around since then. The Jewish people have ancestral connections to the people who lived at that time, right? The, the um, Babylonians are gone. The Romans are gone. The Greeks are gone. The Persians have gone. There's nothing at all. They live in a place called Paras, which happens to probably, for the most part, be the same geographical location, but that's the only real connection. Some say differently when it comes to the prophecy, but anyway. So this is the bear, a big, strong animal. And this, of course, is Madai and Paras. The Paras... Persian exile, okay, and they are uncouth. Now, Daniel saw them with three ribs. He saw the bear with three ribs in its mouth. Three ribs, and the three ribs represent the three rulers of the Persian Empire. That's Cyrus, Ahasuerus, Xerxes, and Darius, Dariavesh, who permitted the Jewish people, some actually because Hazal was the son of Esther and Achashverosh, so 
was actually Jewish, he permitted the Jewish people to go back and rebuild the second temple. Who's okay. Cyrus? Who's Cyrus? Cyrus, yeah. Who's Cyrus? Oh, Kolish. Ahasuerus and Dariavesh. Okay? So that's those three. And that's the three ribs that Daniel saw in the mouth of the bear. Okay? The three ribs over there. <laughs> Fantastic. Next we have the Yavan, the Greek exile, and that was the leopard. That was the leopard. Now, leopards are... Oh, the leopard had four heads. Four-headed leopard he saw, and four wings. Now, when I grew up, we had a book on the Midrash, and someone had drawn the foot, drawn, drawn pictures of these animals, and it, like terrifying images. Like, you really, like, I still have them in my eyes. Right? Some guy drew like the left with four heads and four wings coming out of his back. Okay? So this leopard, first of all, what does a leopard represent? What is a leopard? Leopard is fast, right? The fastest land animal, I believe. Okay? Um, so the leopard represents speed. Who does that represent? From Yavan? Who was fast and got a lot done with a very early age? Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great. Right, who was a great individual, conquered a vast amount of the world, including uh, Eretz Yisrael. Okay, we met Shimon and Tzaddik, and that's the whole Hanukkah story eventually that comes out of that story. Okay, he died very young. He was in his uh, early 30s. Uh, he was 32 years old when he died. He did a vast amount of a very short amount of time. And there were four heads that came out of him. There were four generals that came out of him. Um, there was Ptolemy in Egypt. Seleucid in Assyria, and, uh, and uh, Babylon, Antigonus in Persia, and Asia Minor, and Philip, Alexander's brother, in Macedonia. Okay? You have to get those two, but that's basically what came out of it. And those four were eventually, and he very, he very quickly also took control uh, of a vast uh, area as well. Okay? Okay. The final beast is not an animal, so we're going to call it beast. To, right? And this was the most terrifying. So Daniel has a very similar reaction to the fourth, the Roman exile, as we call it, Edom, has a very similar reaction to it, and he can't even describe it as an, as an animal. Right? There's no creature. It's the fourth one, and they say it's worse than all the three that came before it, and it is literally just an animal, just the beast. It's got iron teeth, okay, representing the iron rulers of the Romans and it had 12 horns sorry 10 horns coming out of its back okay, and these 10 horns represent the 10 generals from Julius Caesar, Augustus, Tiberius Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otho Vitellius, Vespasian and his father Titus eventually destroyed the temple eventually these 10 horns were uprooted and 3 horns came out Three horns came out in the place where these uh, were, and there's a discussion as to who these three smaller horns represent. Some say it's the church, and on and on. Okay? So those are the four exiles of the Jewish people. Most people believe we are still in this one, which Daniel saw, right, and went right through, right through to Nazi Germany, we included in this, all the pogroms, all the crusades. All the things you see in the Western world that's done to the Jewish people comes from this final beast. However, however, the Zohar and others, and there is a great piece of Rav Chaim Vital on his commentary to Tehillim. And over there, he talks about a fifth Galut. So we have the four that we always talk about, the Chazal talk about it. However, they say there is a fifth Galut. And this will be right at the end of Jewish history. Right at the end, right before Mashiach comes. Okay, this is not mainstream, but it's mentioned other places and it's discussed. And it is the Galut of Adam. Adam. Okay, this is the fifth Galut. Okay, small, short Galut. Notice this Galut is referred to as a person 
as opposed to an animal or a beast. So we know we're dealing with something a little bit different. Who is referred to as Adam? Who is referred to as Adam in the Torah? That's going to be our hint to how this is going to play out. Again, we're, always, we're not sure until it happens. But we have an indication. We have a guide. The Torah and the prophets act as a guide. So that is... Nope. Esav is represented by this beast over here and the Western world over here. That's Esav's dominion. And when we get to Gog and Magog, we'll see actually that this Adam is going to overlap with this one and there'll be a battle between this, the Roman Christian world, and this world, which is Peradam. Who's a Peradam? Um, Yishmael. Yishmael, yeah. Yishmael. Now, Yishmael is a very intriguing individual. Was Yishmael bad or good? Well, in total, we like, we like goodies and baddies. We want it to be very clear. Yishmael, was he good or bad? He was bad, but then he did shoot. He was bad, then he did shoot. Very good. Excellent. Okay, that. Very good, right? He was not good, right? But Avram Vidu loved him. And yet, Sarah says, get rid of him. But his mother was Kadosh. She was Hagar, who Avram Vidu married after Sarah and Menu died. So we're dealing with good, and yet we're dealing with an impulse. That's why he's Adam. Okay, Yishmael, B'nai Yishmael, as we see in the Arabs, and they themselves see themselves as sons of they're called Adam. They're a person. They pray. They have sniut. But they're para Adam. They're para. What's para? Wild. Parua. Like paro. Wild. Unbalanced. They have kedusha, but take it to an nth level. It's sniut, but it's taken to an extreme level. They have a serious nefesh, but they kill themselves literally. Okay. So they're Adam. That's, that's a very nice thing. Adam is not an animal. You're an Adam, but it's unbridled. Unbridled. Says Rav Chaim Vital. Quite incredibly. They have schut, and they get control of Har Habayit, where Yaakov had that original dream, remember? Until Mashiach comes. Until Mashiach, they get, that means they get control of Har Habayit, Yerushalayim. And with, why do they get control until Mashiach? And Olam Hazer, we get it Olam Haba. It comes back to us fully. But we're still going to have to deal with them towards the end. Why? Because they get married. They daven. They do Brit Milah. They have Sinyot. They have Religious spiritual people. Okay? They get merit for that. They all that to fill up to go nowhere, not true. To fill up, go to the highest places. And therefore they get dominion. Before Mashiach comes, that's going to be overtaken. How? We don't know. Some people say just like Ishmael did Teshuvah before he died, so too will they do Teshuvah. And they will willingly, Mes Hashem, give us land and say, It's your turn. Hard for us to even imagine that. There's a lot of things that are hard to imagine, really. Right? Universal peace that we're speaking of as well. That is the Zohar. Uh, and that are the other commentators on, on Tehillim. That for the end of days, we'll see these people. We're not in the book. This is all Torah Shabbat Peh. It's all introduction. Okay? Let's see if I missed anything out. So I'm reading my new book, actually. Which is All right. My new source book. Okay? Okay. So they get merit for that, and Aravina's prayer is San Yishma. Oh, most importantly. So what does the word Yishmael mean? It's a very nice name. There was a very famous rabbi in the, to- in the Gemara called Rabbi Yishmael. Rabbi Yishmael Oimeh, right? Yishmael means Yishma Kael. Hashem will listen. What does that reference to? Hashem will listen. When we get attacked, by the Ishmaelites, Hashem Shama will listen to us and answer our prayers. It's a reference to Hashem listening to our tefillah at the end of time when we cry out because of the pain of dealing with Ishmael. How they end up getting taken out, some say, we're not going to be part of it. It's going to be between the beast and Adam. This battle between the Roman Christian world and this, the Muslim Arab world, we're going to have to fight it out. Okay? Some say we're going to be spectators, but it's all going to be taking place in Eretz Yisrael, in Yerushalayim, and around Yerushalayim. Oh, so happened. we're going to be... Oh, it's all taking place over there. Oh, because some say that it, it happened now because of all the Arabs in Europe. No. No, no. Some say that the war of Gog and Magog may have sufficed, some say, sufficed because of what the Jewish people went through over there in terms of our suffering. Okay? But... There's going to be action happening in and around Eretz Yisrael that will lead to this uh, this final. Okay, let's go back to your books. 
was a detour, but a very important one. Page 55. Yeah. Uh, oh, it goes back further. They say in creation. In creation, Karash uh, Baruch made certain references in creation, and that's the first hint towards it. Karash Baruch knew that Galut would be part of the, the, the world's history, exile of the Jewish people. And by the way, notice, everyone in the Galut is always the greatest nations in the world. We're not in Galut to some like, you know, some small tribe in Africa, right? Or some little like group, band of villains in, in Europe, all right? We're always the leading <coughs> nations of the world, okay? And by the way, we left out Egypt, Mitzrayim, because the Jewish people were not a nation yet. But Mitzrayim, they say, was a prototype of all four as well. So it starts in Mitzrayim, it takes four, then it goes back, okay? That's what we refer to Mitzrayim as the beginning of it, okay? But it's not considered part of the four Galuts, yeah? Um, the Persian one, you said there's another one called Medes or something. Uh, Madai, Paras or Madai, right. Madai were the Medians. They were the original ones that exiled us, part of the exile, were Media, and Paras was the main one. Okay, so Mashiach is going to have to fix all of this. Where did Mashiach come from? So let's talk about the tribe that he comes from, because there was a change. Originally, kingship, as we said, came from the tribe of... Binyamin, that was Shaul HaMelech. Shaul HaMelech had the opportunity to kill King Agag from Amalek and all his animals, and he let him live one extra night. He had mercy upon him, whatever that means, and the animals were still there. The prophet said, because of that, you lose your job, and eventually it goes to Yaakov. This is, uh, goes to the tribe of Yehuda. That's why even Yaakov foresaw this and said the following to Yehuda. In Bereshis, Memtes. Lo Yisur Shevim Yehuda, the scepter shall never leave Yehuda, umachoychek mi bein raglav, and the ruler's staff from between his feet, ad ki avo Shilo. Remember Shilo? What was Shilo? One of the four names of Mashiach. Remember that was the shin of Mashiach. Was Shilo, right? Velo yikatamim, and to him shall the obedience of the peoples be. Says the Targum Yonasan. Loi Paskin Malachin Vishalitin Medvos Yehuda. We see that there will never cease to be kings from the rulers of the house of Yehuda. Right? Usfarim Alfei Arios and teachers of Torah thousands from his children until Adzman Dayase Malchem Meshicha. Until Mashiach comes, will be one of his descendants. So we know that Yehuda is the royal tribe. Tr royalty moved from Shevet Binyamin to Shevet Yehuda. From Shaul to David, that's the whole story in Malachim we see. And therefore, he's going to have to be a descendant. Now, the Abar Benel on page 56 says something extraordinary. And he says, yes, he's going to be a descendant of King, uh, of King David, Mashiach. However, he could alternatively or additionally be a reincarnation as well. That's the Abar Benel's take on this. Okay? The Abar Benel. Okay, and he says, Va'avdi David, Melech HaMashiach Yemezera David. The King David is going to be from the seed, Mashiach means from the seed of King David, Aval, Bale HaKabbalah, those who study Kabbalah, which the Abarbanel was very well versed in, Shekamu Kiblu Das Gilgul Nafashot, who received the secret of Gilgul Nafashot, the reincarnation, Amru Shemelech HaMashiach Ye David Atzmo. Say, no, no, no. When it says that Mashiach, is going to be descendant of Mazera, it means it will be him. Not just a descendant of his, Mashiach is David HaMelech in the form of reincarnation. This may not be a contradiction to the fact that he's a descendant. It may not be a contradiction. Right, absolutely. But it's still a different person. He's saying it's two together. Amru Shemelech Mashiach Yeh David Atzmo Ki Hinei Nefesh David Tisgalgel David HaMelech's soul is going to reincarnate but Melech HaMashiach Melech Mashiach himself. Yes. He, how does the Abba Benel know this? He's basing it upon the verses in Ezekiel, and he has this tradition that that's what's going to be. It's Kabbalah. I can't tell you. That's way above my pay scale. That's where he's getting it from. If I was a Kabbalist, I'd be charging a lot more and wearing a turban. Okay. However, yeah. 
lot easier to be able to build the fence than I thought the first time because it was a man of war. Right. So how do we be able to build it? That's a very, very good question. That's, he was meant to build it. He was meant to build it. He was not permitted to build it. He built the he chose the site and he built the foundations. Shlomo HaMelech, his son, was able to build it. However, his descendant will be permitted to do it. And maybe that was the answer and fulfill the mission that David HaMelech wanted. David HaMelech wanted <laughs> nothing else than to build a base. He wanted it so bad, it killed him. Almost as hard as Moshe Rabbeinu not being allowed into Eretz Yisrael. Okay, so this idea of descendancy is very important. The Mashiach is going to have to prove this with a Sefer Yuchsin, with a book that's going to show I'm a direct descendant. Now, this is not such a weird thing. First of all, there were many books that existed of people showing their descendancy from David Melech, right? Um, Maral of Prague, he knew that he was a descendant, okay? Because he traces lineage to Rav Haigaon, who traditionally was a descendant of King David, okay? And Maral of Prague also saw his descendancy to Rashi as well. Rashi saw himself as a descendant from him as well directly. So we're not too sure how it's going to happen. Maybe it's going to be some genealogical, genetic proof he's going to bring. I don't know. When it happens, we'll understand. But it's going to be undeniable and absolute. You will not be able to prove you're a descendant ben ha ben ha ben from David Melach. You ain't got the job. Yeah. Say something? Oh, um, my... Who, who's this? My grandfather. Your grandfather, yeah? And um, he said we're the descendants of Rashi. And I'm learning in class that Rashi is definitely. Yes. Rashi. You told him that? Yeah. That Rashi was from Dabra Melech. Yeah, and then he did his research and like, he like, was able to continue. Potential king. Yeah. He's on his way. Yeah. Teach Torah, move to Israel, build the Beit Migdash. Yeah. He got the job. Right, your grandfather is in. I mean, it, is it your mother's father or your father's father? Okay. Very good. Why? But then her brother could, no? Uh, yeah. Like her brother. Okay. It's going to be Ben It's going to be a, a through the male side. Tribe goes through the male side. Judas goes through the mother's side. Okay? But tribes go through the, 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 the male side. So how do you know Rashi was that his mom or his That was his tradition. Oh, yeah, must be through his father. Must be through his Abba. That was the tra it was a tradition. at a Masorah. He had a Masorah. But what if his Abba was with Mansa? Because Abba's son. Will not do it. It loses it. It's got to be Ben, Aha Ben, Aha Ben, Aha Ben. That's how it gets passed on. It's purely through the father's side. Okay, the prophet Isaiah, who speaks a lot about Mashiach, we'll see a lot more of his prophecies, says Mashiach is not a regular person. This is an individual who has worked on himself tremendously and has perfected himself and is going to have six key traits, which are mentioned in the Gemara. And Rashi talks about it. And Hashem's spirit is going to rest upon him, says the prophet. And he's going to have these six traits. The six traits of Mashiach. Number one, Ruach Chachma, a spirit of wisdom. He's going to be wise. Two, Bina, uh, an understanding. Right, so that's Ruach Chachma, Bina. Three, Ruach Eitza. He's going to have give spirit of counsel, of giving advice. Okay, he's going to be able to relate to people and give them wise counsel as well. Okay, each one of these is individual and unique. Four, four is tremendous gubura, strength. Physical and spiritual, yeah. Five. He's going to have Ruach Das. He's going to have Das, uh, which is great knowledge, a spirit of knowledge, which is different to wisdom. Wisdom is a form of understanding, if you will, of wise. Knowledge is information. And finally, and most importantly, he's going to have Yiras Hashem, fear of God. Okay. He's going to have, he's going to need to have all six of these in order to qualify. A wise person, understanding, a person who gets people, gives advice to them, has inner strength, he's Kovish, he's Yetzer, he's Yetzerhara physically, and spiritual strength. He has tremendous knowledge and information, as we said, Torah Shabbat and Torah Shabbat and Yir Sashem, 
fear of God, which is a reference to mitzvah observance. Okay? Absolute mitzvah observance. Look at the Rambam in Hilchot Malachim. Bottom of the page. Be David Melech in the days of King Mashiach, Kishit Yashev Malchuso, when he's on his throne, his kingdom is, is settled. Bid Katsu Elav Kor Yisrael, and all the Jewish people will come to him. Yitchasu Kulam, he's going to give everyone the Yichas. He's going to tell you if you're Jewish or not. He's going to tell you which tribe you come from. Oh, you think you're from Yehuda? You're actually from Ruvain. Right? He's going to find all these lost nations, a lot of Jews out there in other nations. He's going to pull them out. He's going to tell a person, you thought you were a Kohen? You're not a Kohen. You didn't realize it? You're actually a Kohen. You're a Levi. That's what he's going to do. They're going to gather to him. He's going to determine their lineage. Al Piv Ruach Kodesh. This is not a natural ability. It's a spiritual, holy ability, which is going to, Shatanuach love that is going to rest upon him. He's going to determine their tribe and says this one's for that tribe and that's going to be important because the tribes and tribe affiliations are going to come back. How is he going to do this? How is David HaMelech going to do this? So I'll tell you something unbelievable based upon the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah says, This King Mashiach He's going to be Hericho. The Hericho. Interesting word. What does Hericho mean? Smell. So, when you read the translation, it'll be like he's very animated. It's a ruach. He's, got an, he's an animated individual. Okay? He's not some shy fight. He's going to have to be animated, very charismatic, I guess, would be one thing. However, you can't help but miss in that word, says the Gemara, is the word no. reach, smell. There it is. Smell. And the Gemara says something unbelievable. The Gemara says that he's going to use his sense of smell to determine which tribe, which religion, which position, what is going on with the person. He's got the sense of smell. What does that even mean? What does that mean? So we're not sure. However, however, it's a prophetic form of determination that a person has through the sense of smell. Why smell? So we have to go back to Adam and Rishon. We remember we said in Gan Eden, Adam and Chava sinned by eating from the tree. And they saw the tree, and they tasted the tree, and they heard Hashem's voice, which they didn't listen to. The only thing they didn't do, we are told, is smell. And therefore, this faculty of Reach this is written in a number of places, was not affected and is the most spiritual sense that we have. The sense of smell was called the olfactory system. As you know, you smell something, it takes you back immediately. Okay? It gives you an awareness and understanding which no other attribute and no other sense can give you. And therefore, this sense is untarnished by the sin of the Eitz Adas, has always remained a very spiritual sense. Dogged Mashiach is going to be able to tap into the sense and use it to determine. When Bar Kochba came forward and said, I am Mashiach, they tested him. And they tested his sense of smell. They said, can he smell a judge? Because we know Verricho. He's going to have this ability to smell. And they tested him. And they saw that he did not have that ability. And the rabbis realized that he wasn't Bar Kochba. He wasn't a great, although they thought he had potential to be. He was Bar Kuziba, which is a derogatory term. And they killed him as a false messiah. Some say they didn't actually kill him, but they gave him up to the Roman authorities who allowed him to be killed. So they even use this as a way to determine whether a person is Mashiach. It's used in the Quran, historically was used by the rabbis to establish whether a person has this ability, the Ericho, that the prophet talks about, this animated person who has a sense of smell that can determine. Um, if they determine that someone is Jewish and Jewish, that person is not... That person may have, Ray Kaplan answers that question. 
A lot of this course, by the way, is based on R.A. Kaplan's writings, as we'll see. He seems to think there'll be a short window of opportunity that people, if they want to, will be able to convert. Actually, we'll see part of the signs that we are in the pre-Messianic era is the vast amount of people who are going to try to convert. That's why we see so many converts. And every shul, there's always a convert, right, coming in. These holy, holy individuals who we believe go right back in Jewish history, as we said before. But there'll be a small window of opportunity. But at some point, the window closes, and that's it. Because free will, as we said at the beginning, is going to something dissipate completely, but be lessened. At some point, it will be too easy, and therefore, no more converts. Like in the times of David HaMelech, where they didn't take converts, and the time of Shlomo HaMelech, where they didn't take converts either. So there will be an opportunity to those individuals. Yeah? Isn't the Stalin also the only chance that you can't sin with? You can't? You can't sin with it. Interesting. You cannot sin with a sense of smell. Like you can eat non kosher, you can hear Lush and Hara, you can speak Lush and Hara, you can't smell it. Oh, you can touch things which you're not allowed to touch. <laughs> Physical sexual relationships, once you touch. That's a physical thing. Very good. Natanya, thank you for that. Yeah, I had it very, very nice. I like it. Okay, that's, let's look at the Gemara and let's finish with this. So that was Verichu with Hashem, Velo Lamar Enav. He's going to judge with his, with his Verichu in his sense, Velo uh, Lamar Enav. And not, he's not going to judge with his eyes. You spot Velo Lamar Seaznov. And not with what he hears, Yochiach. So he's saying he's not going to judge with his sight and with his ears, as most judges do. He's going to be a spiritual form of judging. He's going to have Verichu. Rava Amar, the Gemara in Sanhedrin, the Morach Dayan, he's going to smell and judge. Right? And it's based upon the words of uh, Yeshayahu Hanavi, as I the prophet. Okay? He's not going to use his sight. He's going to smell and judge. Right? From the word Miriam. The word Miriam. Okay, we did a lot today. Congratulations. We will finish this uh, next section. We have another few classes of Mashiach uh, on Thursday, Mitzvah Shem. Have a great day. There will be classes Thursday.